this time I'd like to introduce Pushpa Kalra, who will introduce our session today. Good morning, and thank you for coming today and participating in the final lecture of this series on medical matters. Today we have a talk on a very important topic, topical topic. The speaker is Dr. Miguel Chukwin. He joined the faculty at the University of Florida in 2016. He received his medical degree from uh, Lima, Peru in 2003. And from 2010 to 11, he completed a neurology residency and a neuromuscular medicine and EMG fellowship at Washington University in St. Louis. He then joined the faculty at the University of Missouri in Columbia as an assistant professor in neurology. And then he came to Florida in 2016. Here, he currently serves as the neurology clerkship and neuromuscular fellowship director. Dr. Chukwain is broad, board certified in neurology, neuromuscular medicine, and electrodiag uh, electrodiagnostic medicine. He is a member of the American Association of Neuromuscular and Electrodiagnostic Medicine. Today, he's going to tell us about peripheral neuropathy, what it is, the symptoms, the common causes, the workup, and possible treatment options. Thank you, Miguel. Thank you for doing this. All yours. Thank you, Dr. Carra, for a kind invitation to speak today about a topic that I think is very important for everyone. Uh, so I'm going to talk about peripheral neuropathy, about some you know genetic terms and also treatment options. So let's just start with some definitions first. So what do we call peripheral neuropathy? Uh, peripheral neuropathy, neuropathy in general is a term we use as physicians to uh, name any nerve damage, okay? So even carpal tunnel is a type of neuropathy. It's just a different type of neuropathy. Uh, it's a neuropathy of a single nerve. Uh, but so again, neuropathy, we talk about among physicians is just any nerve damage. Now uh, it can affect any nerve or any part of the body. Uh, there are different types of nerves, so they can be different types of neuropathies. There are some sensory nerves that carry some sensory information, pain, temperature, vibration, what we call position sense, a joint, joint position sense. There is a motor nerve that makes you move your muscles, so that carries movement information. And there are some nerves that are the autonomic nerves that carry more uh, fun uh, function of the, this autonomic, so automatic functions in our body, such as, you know, heart rate, bowel movements, you know, production of tears and saliva, those things we don't really control voluntarily, but they're automatic. Um, and the symptoms really are gonna depend on the type of nerve uh, that is affected. So sometimes they're gonna have more sensation symptoms, sometimes you're gonna have more weakness because the motor nerve is affected, sometimes you're gonna have blood pressure fluctuations and things like that uh, if the autonomic nerves are affected. So uh, peripheral neuropathy is one of the most common neuromuscular conditions. So if we uh, put every, every neuropathy together as a whole, then you have, yeah, neuropathy accounts for most of the neuromuscular conditions actually, very common. About 20 million people will have neuropathy in the US at some point in time. It will affect up to 7% of the population. And at least 8% of people above age 55 have neuropathy. And this is because uh, the most common cause of neuropathy is also diabetes. And diabetes is, the prevalence of diabetes is increasing in the US. Um, so there are different patterns of peripheral neuropathy, okay? And I think when patients come to our clinic saying, doctor, I have a neuropathy, um, they usually don't mean carpal tunnel, you know? They usually come to my clinic saying, I have carpal tunnel. But carpal tunnel, like I say, is also neuropathy. But when people uh, that are not physicians talk about neuropathy, they mean numbness in the feet, okay? And that's usually the most common pattern of neuropathy. So we call it stocking and glove distribution of symptoms of peripheral neuropathy. So the symptoms start in the, in the toes and slowly move up to the knees. And by the time it gets up to the knees, so you have numbness up to your knees, then your fingers start getting numb and, and, and so on, keeps moving upwards. So it's a length dependent pattern, slowly progressing upwards. That's also called a stocking and rub distribution. This is the most common type of neuropathy pattern. 
and most people with neuropathy, like I say, are going to be uh, older, about age, age 55 or 60. Uh, so in terms of symptoms of neuropathy, uh, like I say, most neuropathies are going to have sensation problems, sensation symptoms, and there are two, many type, uh, two main types of sensory symptoms. One is the positive symptom in which the nerves are misfiring. You know, you're, they're giving you extra information that is not really there. You, know, you feel pain when there's nothing, you know, bothering your feet, but you, still your feet are hurting. You feel like you're walking on needles or, or you know, nails or it feels that like you have fire under your feet. All those things are uh, for a nerve misfire, uh, you know, giving you erroneous information, uh, basically conveying that information to your brain when nothing is there, but it's obviously very uncomfortable anyway. Those are the positive symptoms. What about negative symptoms? Negative symptoms are, are kind of the opposite. You know, your nerves don't fire when they should, so you don't feel anything. It's completely numb, it's like dead, you know. Uh, a lack of feeling. And uh, you can also notice poor balance of loss of position sense. Like, you know, you have trouble walking in the dark because you don't know where your feet are. You really have to hold on to something to keep your balance. Um, it can also involve weakness. You know, the muscle, uh, the motor nerve is not functional, then obviously your muscle is not gonna work and you're gonna have some weakness. And there could be some muscle atrophy as a result as well. Um, other symptoms that are also uh, part of a neuropathy in some cases are the uh, automatic or autonomic nerve involvement. For example, digest digestive problems. This includes early satiety, you know, a lot of constipation, or incontinence, heat intolerance, or lack of sweating, erectile dysfunction, blood pressure fluctuations, passing out. You know, you get up too fast and ooh, you go down because you feel so dizzy. Um, and neuropathy also carries an increased risk of ulcers of infections in the feet because people may have injuries in their feet and they don't have pain. And pain is a protective mechanism, really. You know, when you have pain in your feet, you don't want to step with it so you don't get injuries. But uh, you don't feel that the pain, then you keep injuring your foot and then it may get infected. Uh, so in terms of progression, most of the neuropathies, like diabetic neuropathy, uh, most of them really, they will progress very slowly, okay? So we're talking about years, not even weeks to months. We're talking about years. There are some of them that are, can progress rapidly within weeks. Uh, one, of, one of those is called GVS, for example, guillain barre syndrome, it's an autoimmune neuropathy. But those are rare, um, by, by and large, most people don't have those, you know, most people have diabetic neuropathy, vitamin deficiency neuropathy, and they're gonna progress slowly. Um, so if we talk already about the symptoms, um, so the neuropathy types, like I say, can be divided by the type of nerve fiber that is affected. So sensory neuropathies, mot motor neuropathies, autonomic neuropathies, or mix when you have a sensory motor or, or sensory motor and autonomic fibers affected. But you can also divide neuropathies uh, by the type of structure in the nerve that is affected. So this is a figure. Uh, can you see my cursor, by the way? Can you see the cursor moving in the screen? Yeah, okay. So this is a, a, a nerve. Okay, the nerve body, cell body, and this is the axon. This is the uh, prolongation of the body. And this will connect with a muscle here or with the skin here, you know? If it's a sensory nerve, it will be the skin. If it's a muscle, uh, it's a motor nerve. So you have uh, the, the axon is this blue cylinder, and then this lighter blue or kind of turquoise uh, color is what we call the myelin, okay? The myelin sheath. This is like, like the insulation of the nerve. The axon is in the middle and the myelin sheet covers the axon. Um, wh why is the myelin sheet important? Well, it makes your nerve conduct rapidly. Otherwise it will conduct way slower. It wouldn't be as fast, but it wouldn't work as well. So you have this myelin to make your nerve conduct faster. So depending on the type of neuropathy, you can have damage to the axon itself. Those are called axonal neuropathies, or you can have damage to the myelin itself which are the demyelinating neuropathies uh, when the insulation is affected, okay? There can also be mixed, mixed neuropathies in which both the structures are affected. And this is uh, relevant for treatment options or for prognosis because if you have damage to the axon, remember the axon is this uh, blue structure cylinder here coming from the nerve itself. 
So if you, you kill this axon, the nerve has to grow back all the way to, uh, to the place where it was going before. So that takes time and maybe uh, that growth may be actually incomplete. And, and so you, in terms of recovery, may not be as good. Versus if you have a myelin damage only, you know, sparing the axon, this myelin uh, gets uh, synthesized really fast. So you can recover in weeks to months um, and prognosis is better. So let's talk about causes of neuropathy. So etiology of neuropathy. There are many causes, you know, textbooks are written about different types of neuropathies. So we cannot discuss all of them. But the most common is diabetes, okay? About 60 to 70% of all neuropathies in adults are gonna be from diabetes. After that, you know, second term most common causes are gonna be vitamin deficiencies. And we're gonna talk about that briefly later. And also alcohol, excessive alcohol consumption, consumption will, can also affect the nerves. Um, other causes include uh, monoclonal proteins, uh, which are abnormal proteins that we have in our blood, bloodstream. And the, free, the prevalence of these abnormal proteins increases with age. And so it's important to do some screening because some of them can be associated with also with multiple myeloma, for example. And when these proteins deposit in the nerve, it can cause neuropathy. Other more rare causes are uh, listed here. You know, you have autoimmune problems, vasculitis, which is inflammation in the blood vessels and the nerve, toxins like heavy metals, chemotherapy, you know, trauma, some infections, tumors, chronic, chronic problems like kidney failure, liver, liver failure, thyroid, and also genetic causes. But uh, by and large, you know, if we screen for diabetes, vitamin deficiencies, and these monoclonal proteins, we capture most of the neuropathies. Uh, so how do we make a diagnosis of neuropathy? Okay, so you, uh, you typically see patients and they come, doctor, I have a neuropathy. I have numbness and tingling in my feet. Okay, so that history is important, right? If I hear numbness and tingling in the feet, uh, you know, like has been there for months to years, I'm like, okay, this is neuropathy already. And now I have to get more history about positive symptoms, negative symptoms, what type of fibers are affected, like sensory fibers, motor fibers, maybe autonomic symptoms, which are listed here, you know, dry eyes, dry mouth, you know, incontinence or retention of bowel and bladder, passing out, which comes from blood pressure fluctuation. It's also called syncope or presyncope, also called orthostatic hypotension and erectile dysfunction. All those things can be a sign of neuropathy. Not always, but you know, it can be a sign of neuropathy. And, and then we got moved to the exam, right? In the exam, like I say, most patients with neuropathy have this length dependent pattern of, of findings in which the feet are affected the most and then slowly the, the symptoms decrease as you move up. So uh, people are gonna have decreased sensation to pain, temperature, vibration, uh, usually in the feet, decreased reflexes, especially at the ankles. Weakness, uh, not always present, but if the motor fibers are affected, yes, they can have foot drop, for example, or weakness in the hands. And balance problems, uh, which come from joint positions. And so they have trouble walking one foot in front of the other, or or uh, if, if they put the feet together, they cannot close their eyes because they may fall, you know, because they lose their balance. So all those, all those physical findings will support a diagnosis of neuropathy. And then uh, we can confirm the neuropathy doing a certain test. One of them is the nerve conduction study EMG, okay? So the nerve conduction study EMG really has two parts. One is a nerve conduction study per se, in which is an electrical study of the nerve function. Um, we uh, stimulate the nerves with electricity um, and we record the nerve responses. And, and some people are afraid of this test because obviously we, you know, we are giving electric discharges, okay? So it's not painless. I wouldn't say it's completely painful either, you know, extremely painful, but pain tolerance depends on, on the patient. You know, every person has their own threshold of pain tolerance. Uh, so it's variable. This is a figure uh, illustrating uh, how, do, how we obtain these responses. Um, this is a motor nerve conduction study, and this is a sensory nerve conduction study. So for the motor nerve conduction study, we use these electrodes. Uh, G1 is the recording electrode. We record from the muscle, in this case, in this case from the clinal eminence from here with the base of the thumb. And this is the reference electrode, and we use the ground. 
and then we stimulate at the wrist, recording from the muscle. This is a stimulation of the median nerve, for example. Um, for the sensory nerve conduction study, uh, we are going to record directly from the nerve fibers in the skin. So we use these ring electrodes, for example, we are recording from the finger. And the same, you know, we have a recording electrode, reference electrode, the ground, we are stimulating the median nerve, recording from the finger. So these give us um, uh, nerve responses for motor and sensory. And the second part of this electrical study is the electromyography or the EMG. Um, so this is an electrical study of the muscle, okay? Um, so I tell my patients we're using this microphone. Uh, it's not really a microphone, okay? So you cannot use it to sing a song or something like that, but it produces noise. So it, it converts the electrical activity of the muscle into waveforms and sound, so you can interpret it. Um, so there is no stimulation with this, it's just a recording. Okay, so no shocking, it's just recording from the muscle. Um, there are a lot of waveforms and, and they have specific meaning for you know, people that are trained to interpret them. And, and basically we're looking for evidence of nerve and muscle injury. And the pain with a needle study, again, depends on the patient uh, tolerance. Uh, it's variable. So this is a figure showing you know, EMG needle, and this is the ground, and we're gonna insert the needle inside the muscle. And how many insertions would you have? It depends on the, the, the condition they're looking for, okay? Um, so it could be just a few muscles, maybe three to five muscles. It could be as extensive 15, 20 muscles. I mean, it, it just depends on what we're looking for. And this is a video. Uh, uh, to show you normal muscle activity and the EMG. So I hope you can hear it. So this, this is spikes that you see here, this is, these are called a motor unit potentials. Okay, so each spike represents a motor unit. And this is a normal, normal activity, normal muscle, okay. And we ask the patient, you know, keep contracting the muscle a little more as the contraction strength increases, then the activity of the muscle fibers also increases, the frequency increases. For example, there at the end, we're asking the patient to contract more, you get better uh, frequency of the motor units there. So that's the EMG. Um, so once we confirm, okay, this is a neuropathy, um, right, we can do uh, some extra workup to find the causes of the neuropathy, right? Like I say, the most common cause is diabetes. So we have to check for diabetes for sure. So for diabetes, uh, the best test, the most sensitive test is the fasting two hour glucose tolerance test, uh, in which, you know, you have to be fasting for about eight to 10 hours. The next day in the morning, you get a blood draw, you get a blood draw, and then uh, they give you a, a sweet liquid to drink that has 75 grams of glucose. And then, you know, you hang around the lab for about two hours and you get the blood drawn again. Basically what the, the test is measuring is your ability to handle the sugar load over two hours. And there are certain numbers that mean, okay, you have uh, diabetes or you have pre-diabetes depending on the level you hit and the two hour values. You can also get an A1C. The A1C is a different type of test. It measures the, the amount of uh, high sugar you have for the last three months. Um, and then you can check vitamin levels. Common vitamins check are B12, folic, and you can also check B6. And then looking for these proteins that I was talking about, these monoclonal proteins that can deposit in the nerves, we need to do a protein electrophoresis or serum immunofixation. Okay, the serum immunofixation is better. And, and you can also do in some cases other vitamin levels such as B1, copper, if we suspect you know, autoimmune disease or you have a history of lupus or rheumatoid arthritis, Sjogren's disease, then yes, sure, we're gonna look for more autoimmune causes, uh, including vasculitis, which is inflammation, usually from autoimmune disease as well. Um, in certain cases, we can do genetic testing for neuropathies, especially if there is a strong family history. Um, one thing to remember is that uh, there is something called idiopathic, okay, which is neuropathy of unknown etiology, unknown cause. So we do all the workup, uh, known to man, you know, the textbooks, and it's still everything comes back normal, 
but you still have neuropathy. I mean, the neuropathy is real. That means it's idiopathic. That actually represents 30 to 50% of the cases of neuropathy, especially above 60, okay? So it's actually pretty common for people that are 60, 70 years of age, they have neuropathy. We do all the workup. Yes, neuropathy is there, it's real, uh, but we, you know, we don't have a cause, so we cannot uh, try to fix it. Treatment in those cases is mostly symptomatic. Um, what about MRI? Um, so uh, not, not, not routinely, okay? So if we're thinking you have neuropathy in your feet, you don't need an MRI, but you, know, you also have back pain or sciatica. Sure, we may need a lumbar MRI to look for pinched nerves in your back, things like that. Uh, so that's only in special cases. We don't we routinely do MRI. The same for lumbar puncture. Unless we're looking for inflammation or certain autoimmune causes, we won't, we won't get it. You know, it's not needed. Um, biopsies, so nerve, muscle, or skin biopsy, also in special cases. Uh, nerve muscle biopsy, especially in suspicion of vasculitis or inflammation in the nerves and the blood vessels, we could do that. Or there's a condition called amyloidosis, which is a chronic protein deposit in the nerve. You can also do that. You know, we suspect you have leprosy or things like that. Yeah, you need a nerve biopsy, but those are pretty rare. And skin biopsy, not routine not routinely done unless you, we suspect something called a small fiber neuropathy, which I'm gonna talk about. Um, so in terms of diagnosis, one thing to remember is that you know, the most common uh, uh, order test is this EMG. You know, the EMG test, which is electromyography, studies the muscle and also the nerve study, electrical study of the nerve. But these two tests only assess the large fibers, okay? And what does that mean? What are the large fibers? Well, the large fibers are, are not the longest fibers. That's a, that is a difference, confusion, okay? Don't confuse large fibers with the longest fibers. Large fibers is a, it's a pathological description. When we cut the nerves uh, so, uh, transversally, uh, we have these this different diameters of nerves in, under the microscope, okay? So large diameter fibers have a lot of myelin. Remember the myelin, the insulation I was talking about? So the nerves that have a lot of myelin are called, are called large nerve fibers. The nerves that don't have myelin, like this one, or have just a tiny bit of myelin around it, this is small fibers, okay? Now, the EMG and nerve study only checks large fibers. We cannot check the small fibers with this EMG, with the nerve, uh, the nerve conduction study. But there are neuropathies that affect only the small fibers. So in those cases, in those, in those small fiber neuropathies, the nerve study is normal, okay? So you can have a small fiber neuropathy, which is a real neuropathy with a normal nerve conduction study. So those are the small fiber neuropathies. Those are, uh, you need a different type of test for that. Um, so if you have a nerve study and EMG that is normal and you still have neuropathy, then you may have a small fiber neuropathy and those are the fibers that carry temperature and pain sensation. And the diagnosis in those cases is done with a skin biopsy or uh, autonomic testing because uh, the autonomic fibers are small fibers as well. So what's a skin biopsy? Uh, well, biopsy, you know, we remove a piece of something, right? So we remove a piece of skin. So we use a small incision, a punch incision, about three millimeters. Uh, usually in the lateral side of the leg and also the thigh. And then the pathologist will look at it under the microscope uh, to count the number of small fibers you have in your skin. If the number falls below a certain range, then okay, you have a small fiber neuropathy, which may explain some of the pain or cold, hot sensation you have in your feet, or, uh, depending where the location is. So this is an example of you know, small fiber neuropathy. This will be the punch incision already being removed. And you, you have a little hole left that usually gets a uh, small scar. Nothing major. It's like a deep scratch for you. So let's talk about, so that's, that's in terms of diagnostic uh, 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 testing. Now I'm gonna talk about uh, some of the etiologies of neuropathy, okay? So one of them I mentioned is alcohol. Um, so alcohol is, has direct toxic effect on, uh, on nerves. And also people that uh, abuse alcohol, they commonly have nutritional deficiencies such as vitamin B1. Vitamin B1 level being low, 
can also be toxic to nerves. So it can be a combination of direct effect of the alcohol and also some nutritional deficiencies. Um, people usually have you know, pain, numbness, and weakness, foot drop, things like that. Um, and alcohol neuropathy can also affect autonomic nerves. So it can cause blood pressure fluctuations, sweating abnormalities, erectile dysfunction, all these other things. Like, like we mentioned already with other neuropathies. So uh, a little more about alcohol neuropathy. So uh, in terms of how much alcohol is present in drinks, uh, one drink uh, contains about 14 grams of pure alcohol. Um, this is equivalent to about 12 ounces of beer, uh, five ounces of wine, or one and a half ounces of spirits. Um, the presence of neuropathy, you know, you have a drink today, uh, or beer or something, it's not like you're gonna get neuropathy tomorrow by any means, you know, it has to be uh, a constant high use of alcohol it kind of accumulates over your lifetime or about a certain number of years. And then, and then you start developing neuropathy. So it's nothing like you, you have a pinch, you know, alcohol drink today, or, and then tomorrow, or next week you have neuropathy. It doesn't work like that. Um, so most, most people with neuropathy had more than 100 grams of alcohol use per day for more than three to 10 years. Um, among all alcoholics, about up to close to 70% of, uh, of them can have neuropathy, and maybe half of them is subclinical. What does that mean? They don't know they have it. Okay. But if they go to the doctor, uh, they, you know, you have decreased sensation in your feet and you have reduced reflexes in your ankles maybe. But you didn't know about it because you don't have pain. Perhaps you have more of the numbness feeling, but maybe you don't even notice it. So that's important. Some people don't know they are developing. Um, and again, neuropathy correlates with duration of uh, intake and also total lifetime consumption of alcohol. So diabetic neuropathy, like I say, that's the most common cause of neuropathy in adults. Up to 70% of all the neuropathies in you know, a clinic can be just from diabetes. Um, it's usually poorly controlled diabetes. It can happen even in, in people that are diagnosed with pre-diabetes, okay? So there is this con concept of pre-diabetes, which is, you know, you have glucose intolerance or your fasting glucose is elevated. Well, that is also associated with neuropathy. Usually a small fiber neuropathy, usually painful neuropathy. So, uh, so you don't want to have pre-diabetes either. Um, up to 7% of the US population adults have diabetes. Up to 70% of them will have neuropathy. And, and some of them are going to have significant pain or also numbness. So the diabetic neuropathy uh, can actually have different patterns, okay? The most common is gonna be the one I mentioned in which the feet affect, uh, get affected first and then slowly move up. Uh, but, you know, diabetic, diabetic neuropathy can also cause, for example, carpal tunnel or a pinched nerve in your knee or a pinched nerve in your elbow. It basically increases your risk of any type of neuropathy. Uh, so that's important. Diabetes can, can mimic any other neuropathy that you can think of. Uh, the treatment for diabetic neuropathy, you know, is basically focusing on glucose control, okay? Trying to get your glucose under control as much as you can, and then uh, focus on symptomatic therapy. So you have a lot of pain, there are nerve pain medications to control the pain. Um, you have foot drop, then you, you, you use braces at the ankles, try to, you know, get around that. Um, and, and diabetic neuropathy is usually uh, affecting the axons, so the nerve itself. So the recovery, if you see recovery, it's gonna be very slow, okay? So you have, but you have to give your nerves the chance to recover. So you have to try to control your diabetes the best you can. Uh, like I say, diabetic neuropathy can affect different types of nerves, not just the feet nerves, okay? It can affect uh, the nerves that move your muscles in your eyes. So it can cause double vision. It can cause carpal tunnel. So that's the nerve in the hand and the wrist. It can cause something called plexopathy, which is the bundle of nerves that go to your arm and your legs. So it can cause weakness in the whole arm, the whole leg. It could also mimic shingles. So it can be very intense pain. It can cause blood pressure fluctuations because of these autonomic fibers that get affected. So it can cause people to pass out. And if you develop autonomic neuropathy from diabetes, that actually increases mortality. Uh, so that's, uh, that has been proven before. So other common cause of neuropathy is B12, B12 deficiency. 
So the amount of B12 we need is actually very small, okay? 2.4 micrograms a day. That's like almost nothing, you know, it's a very tiny amount. So you really, most people won't have B12 deficiency unless something is wrong with their stomach or their gut, or, you know, they really, really not eating at all, you know? So it's a very small amount. And, and B12 accumulates in your liver, and I think some in your kidneys as well, mostly the liver. So you have a reserve there that even if you stop eating B12, it will be, I think, between two to five years for you to notice that you have symptoms from B12 deficiency because you have a reserve and you only need a very tiny amount. Um, B12 is present uh, in meat, eggs, poultry, dairy. So people that are uh, vegan, for example, don't eat any, you know, any animal products, then yes, they have a high risk of B12 deficiency. Otherwise, if you're vegetarian, but you have, you know, some poultry or, or you know, some dairy stuff, you, you will not uh, suffer B12 deficiency. But uh, you're vegan, yes, you have gastric bypass, of course, because B12, uh, part of the metabolism, of course, in the stomach. So you don't have your stomach, uh, well, that's not gonna be metabolized. Um, if you uh, interfere with the acid production of the stomach, you need the acid, acid production in the stomach to metabolize B12, like medications such as Prilosec or, you know, famotidine, things like that. They can increase your risk of B12 deficiency. Use of metformin, for example, in people with diabetes, or Crohn's, celiac disease, which are more like uh, digestive diseases, autoimmune diseases, they can also interfere with the B12 absorption. So most of the B12 uh, neuropathy is gonna be distal, affecting the feet and then slowly moving up, but it can also affect the spinal cord, okay? So that's important because uh, your neuropathy it affects your feet, the nerves going to your legs, uh, that can recover, but if your spinal cord get affected, gets affected, then that may be irreversible. So uh, in some cases, depending on how bad it is, because the spinal cord doesn't regrow. So that's very important to recognize early. Uh, so the treatment of this will be B12 supplementation. Okay, so if you have gastric bypass surgery, uh, a common recommendation is to take your bariatric vitamins, you know. Uh, some people don't do that. Some people take them just for a couple of years and they feel okay and they stop taking the vitamins. Well, they're gonna have some problems down the road. So you wanna, you know, you have gastric bypass, you have to take your vitamins forever, basically. Okay, don't stop them. Um, now, if you, you found out you have low B12 and you haven't had any gastric bypass surgery, then either you're not eating enough B12, which is rare, like I mentioned, you may be vegan, or you have a problem with absorption of your B12, okay? So that's a problem that you have in your stomach and your absorption. So you need to supplement, okay? So a common mistake is you have low B12 and your physician tells you, oh yeah, take some B12. Well, your B12 is gonna go up, right? In six months, it's gonna be very high, and then your physician tells you, okay, your B12 is high, you can stop now. Well, you know, unless you find out why your B12 was low, you shouldn't stop, okay? You should continue taking it because it's gonna go down again. And then you're gonna have, you may have a problem again. So just make sure if your B12 is low, if you don't find out why, then you just have to keep taking it. Supplements, uh, that's for life. Low B12 can also cause anemia, so low hemoglobin and also memory loss. So that's actually included as, as a workup for us as a reversible cause of dementia. So B12 affects the brain too. So that's also important to remember. So what about folic acid? Folic acid is another vitamin that is important for nerves. Uh, it's present in dark vegetables, uh, legumes. The requirement is 400 and 600 micrograms. So it's also a small requirement, a little more than B12 though. And it also causes neuropathy, you know, length dependent, distal on the feet, very symmetric. It can also cause anemia, memory loss, and spinal cord problems. So very similar to B12 uh, in terms of symptoms. B6, B6 is also called pyridoxine, okay, pyridoxine. The daily requirement is two milligrams per day. Okay, still a small amount. And when you have deficiency, you can also have neuropathy, so numbness and tingling, some weakness. And B12, B6 deficiency is associated with some medications in some cases, such as using INH, or isoniazide. This is a medication used for prophylaxis of tuberculosis. And hydralazine is a medication used for blood pressure, for example, or penicillamine, it's an autoimmune medication. 
Um, you have a you know extreme diet, uh, malabsorption, malnutrition. Yes, you can have B6 deficiency, chronic illness such as renal failure, or chronic liver failure. Sometimes are associated with B6 deficiency. Uh, now, uh, one thing to remember for B6 is yes, you have low B6, you can have neuropathy, but if you take too much B6, it would also be a problem. Okay. So you have low B6, you have neuropathy, you have too much B6. So some people buy this B6 at the grocery store and, and look at this, it has 100 milligrams of B6. So that's 50 times what you need a day, okay? Two milligrams a day you need. You're taking 50 times the recommended amount every day, then you will get toxic on B6. And when you get toxic on B6, then you actually make, uh, cause more damage to your nerves because B6 is toxic to nerves in excess. So you can have a lot of sens sensation loss and balance problems with excessive B6. So you just wanna take the right amount, maybe 50 milligrams a week or 25 a week should be enough to supplement. You know, you only need two milligrams a day. Really. Um, so don't take an excess of vitamin B6 supplements. Now, in terms of immune neuropathies or inflammatory neuropathies, uh, these are autoimmune. And the most common, uh, two most common are CIDP and multifocal motor neuropathy. So CIDP is, uh, is an acronym standing for this chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy, multifocal motor neuropathy, uh, sometimes confused with ALS uh, clinically because it also causes atrophy and fasciculations so or muscle twitching in the muscles. And the treatment, because this is an autoimmune, this autoimmune disease, uh, includes IBIG, which is immunoglobulin intravenous, and plasmapheresis, which is like a dialysis of the blood, a washing out of the blood, and also steroids like prednisone. In terms of inherited neuropathies, again, those are not common, okay? I wouldn't say everyone has these neuropathies, but it's less than 10% of all the neuropathies. But it's important to recognize because if you suspect this is genetic, then you don't need to do all this extensive workout, right? Or even try, try to give steroids or things like that that will cause more damage. Um, genetic neuropathy is also called CMT, Charcot-Marie Tooth. And we usually have a family history or we look at a patient's feet and they have these high arches with hammer toes or claw hands like these or atrophy of the leg muscles. And those are all giveaways that this may be genetic. These are markers of a very long-standing neuropathy. And these neuropathies uh, have very slow progression, don't have a treatment. So the treatment is just supportive in this case. And there is a way of diagnosing this with genetic testing. Uh, there, are, there are many panels available. Uh, actually, some of them are free of charge. And then we come to idiopathic neuropathy. Like I mentioned, up to 30 to 50% of people above 60 can have what we call idiopathic neuropathy, which means neuropathy without a specific etiology, no cause identified. Um, these neuropathies are gonna progress very slowly. They usually affect the feet and then slowly move upwards. And the treatment is just symptomatic as well. So nerve pain medications, orthotics, and things like that. So we uh, now we'll talk about treatments, okay? So the treatment really, it will depend on the cause, right? If I find you have diabetes, then you're gonna focus on your diabetes control. If you have B12 deficiency, you're gonna focus on, you know, taking your B12 supplements. If you have low folic acid, you take folic acid and so on. But so that, that is obvious, you have to do that. But on top of that, you have a lot of pain or tingling, you know, then we can, use medications to control those symptoms because those are very uncomfortable. So we treat the symptoms, especially pain, with different types of medications. Some of them are listed here, analgesics, you know, anti-epileptics, so medications for seizures, but they can block nerve impulses. Uh, there are gabapentin, for example, Lyrica, uh, antidepressants such as amitriptyline, nortriptyline, duloxetine, which is Cymbalta, capsaicin cream, lidocaine cream, tramadol, some people use opioids and there is physical therapy, or, you know, assisted devices such as cane, walkers, and food care that's especially important for people with diabetes. You know, you have a lot of sensory loss, even if you don't have diabetes, uh, you should treat your food as, uh, as if it was a diabetic food because you're at risk of having infections and injuries to your food. 
So in terms of diabetes, controlling blood sugar would, can prevent you know, future nerve damage. Vitamin deficiencies, you're gonna you know, take the vitamin you're missing. For autoimmune, then you're gonna take immunosuppressants. And exercise is very important, uh, reduces pain and improves the mood and health. More specific uh, other recommendations, there's something called TENS unit, which is electrical stimulus to uh, the skin and to the nerves in the skin. And it can reduce pain in some people, you know, so that's something worth trying if you haven't tried it before. Not everybody finds, finds it helpful though, but that's uh, something to try if medications are not working. Smoking is recommended to stop because it can increase pain. Um, like I say, alcohol is toxic to nerves. So you have bad neuropathy and you drink, you may want to actually stop drinking because you may be causing more, more harm. Uh, healthy diet, so that includes, you know, a lot of vegetables and fruits to keep all your vitamin levels where they're supposed to be. Uh, don't take too much B6 because that can be toxic to nerves. And, and at the end, the degree of improvement will depend on the how much nerve damage you have, okay? So you have a lot of nerve damage and you had this neuropathy for 20 years, then, you know, it's very unlikely that your nerves are gonna be back to normal ever again. It's just not realistic, okay? So we should focus on controlling the symptoms and trying to stop progression perhaps. So other medications that uh, are more like supplements to try, you know, alpha lipoic acid, especially in people with diabetes, Cur curcumin or turmeric in some patients can help decrease the pain, uh, acetylcarnitine in some patients, again, they find it helpful. This doesn't apply to everyone, but, you know, some people. Vitamin D and people with diabetes, even if you don't have low levels, could help pain. Again, that's you know based on a small case series. Um, folic acid in 75 patients improve the uh, neuropathy. Omega-3 fish oil and, and B12 um, and, and some patients with neuropathy as well, uh, even without B12 deficiency. So again, those are measures that I don't think they hurt, you know. Uh, you want to take extra B12, you want to take extra folic acid. Uh, you know, there is no folic acid toxicity or B12 toxicity, so I don't think it's harmful. It may be helpful for you. So what about exercise? Exercise in general is obviously recommended for, you know, just to maintain good health, okay? So aerobic exercise is preferred. What is that? Uh, that's like running, you know, bicycling. Uh, those are like uh, swimming, aerobic exercise, okay? So weightlifting would be more anaerobic exercise, for example. And you wanna get up to uh, 40 to 60% of your heart rate reserve. And what is that? What is a heart rate reserve? So HRR is, is the heart rate reserve. So you calculate your maximum heart rate, which is 220 minus your H, versus, uh, and you subtract from that your resting heart rate, and that's your heart rate reserve. So for example, I'm 43, so 220 minus 43 will be 170 something. That will be my maximum heart rate. And my resting heart rate is like, I don't think 80 or something. So that will be my heart rate reserve will be like 80 beats per minute. So you wanna target uh, 40 to 60% of that. Uh, you wanna exercise three times a week, and average about 90 to 100 minutes, 180 minutes per week. So. You know, just follow a regimen to exercise, and I think it will be helpful. Uh, uh, this is the last slide, I believe. Um, there is another uh, treatment modality called the spinal cord stimulation. Okay, so uh, this involves um, introducing an electrode lead, so a wire in, in, inside the epidural canal. So this is the spinal cord here, yellow, and adjacent to it is the epidural space, and the wire goes up targets usually T10 around that area for the lower extremities. And then uh, that wire is connected to a battery pack where the stimulator is, and then it's activated and basically tries to block the pain stimulus from reaching your brain, okay? This has been shown to help uh, control pain or reduce pain by more than 50% uh, and, and people with a refractory pain including people with you know, diabetic neuropathic pain or even just chronic pain in the lower extremities. Um, not everybody finds it helpful, obviously. You know, uh, Follow-up studies, 55%, maybe 70% of people continue to have some benefit after five years, but uh, this is not 100%. You know? 
it's not like it's gonna cure everyone, but it's something to try if you have failed other medications and you still wanna uh, try to reach some relief um, uh, and your nerve pain in the feet. Okay, so that was a lot of information. Okay, so now people may be confused. So you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was really very, very informative talk. I'm sure we have some questions. First, I'll take questions from the Oak Room. There is one, let's start with one on the chat box. It says, if a person has severe neuropathy in the lower leg below the knee, does it lead to gangrene or amputation? Not, not directly. So neuropathy is uh, damage to the nerve fibers going to your, uh, well, to your body, you know, in this case, the feet probably, you don't feel, you don't have sensation there. But uh, if you have severe neuropathy affecting, for example, at blood vessels as well, because the nerves also go to the blood vessels. So that can affect circulation in your feet. And that can lead to uh, some poor circulation in the toes. And if you injure your foot and you don't feel it, you can also get infected. And also the uh, healing process will be slow because you don't have enough blood flow. And also lack of innervation of, you know, your skin also interferes with healing. So indirectly, you know, you get an infection on the wound. Yes, it may get infected and may lead to gangrene, but it's not a direct effect. Thank you. We have a question from the audience here. Uh, yes, uh, actually, uh, two questions, if I can. First of all, uh, you indicated that it's progressive, um, but it's measured in years. Is there any way that you can be a little more specific in that? If you have neuropathy in the feet, uh, you know, tingling of the feet, uh, but that's it, how long might it take to progress up the legs? And the second question is uh, spinal cord stimulation. Uh, would it be true that if you had the spinal cord stimulator uh, installed that you could then no longer have an MRI? Yeah, so the, okay, sure. It's a good question. So about progression, yeah, I mentioned years. So uh, idiopathic neuropathies, for example, will be years. I would say five, 10 years, sometimes even longer. So really the progression will depend on the specific etiology. If you have, for example, one of these neuropathies, autoimmune neuropathies, like CIDP that I mentioned, those are a little faster, okay? We're talking about one, two years, people can get very uh, disabled. Um, you have diabetic neuropathy, uh, we're talking about years. So five, 10 years, um, unless your sugar is not uh, constantly 500, so then probably will be faster. So again, there's a lot of variability. There is no rule book about how fast it's gonna progress for a specific person. Uh, but I will say most of the people that we see in clinic have at least one year of symptoms, okay? That it comes from numbness and tingling. And sometimes when you pinpoint a little more, hold on, you have these symptoms and they start recalling, well, you know, I had some tingling two, three years ago, but I didn't think much of it. And now they come to see me because it's completely numb. You know, it's, it's not just tingling, it's now really numb. So there, has, there was some progression there. For B12 deficiency, um, depending if you have it for, for that long and you've been supplementing, perhaps it will be you know, a year or two, but if it's you know, really, really low for uh, even short period of time, people can be in the hospital because like I say, spinal cord can get affected and it will affect your balance. So uh, those are things that sometimes we get admitted and we diagnose them with B12 deficiency in the hospital. So they can be a little more uh, rapid. But, but as a group, you know, when you say years, because most of the neuropathies are diabetic neuropathies, 60, 70% of them. The second question was, oh, the spinal cord stimulator. So the spinal cord stimulator, uh, the old ones uh, were not MRI compatible. Now, a lot of these uh, electrical devices and wires and, and battery packs are MRI compatible. So you just have to request, I talk to your doctor saying, I want an MRI compatible one. And they usually offer those anyway, because MRI is needed for many things now. And, 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 and the only thing that needs to be done when you have an MRI is to have the uh, representative from like Medtronic or the person that uh, manufactures a device to come and turn it off. And then you can have your uh, MRI and then they turn it back on after that. 
question? Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Um, I noticed you didn't mention stroke as a cause of neuropathy, peripheral neuropathy, and I wonder why that was. Yeah, so neuropathy, like I say, is, is, is a term we use to um, refer to nerve damage at least as a peripheral nerve damage, meaning from the spinal cord out, okay? So the nerves that come from the spinal cord out towards your body, to your arms, your legs, or your face, if they are damaged at some point, we call it a neuropathy. Uh, the stroke is uh, uh, damage in your brain, inside your skull, so in the brain. So that's a different type of, of uh, it wouldn't be a neuropathy. It can also cause numbness, of course. If you have a stroke, you can have numbness and weakness, but it, it's not, by definition, it, it's not considered a neuropathy. Yeah, thank you. I have one okay, here. there is one on the chat box. It says, what are the benefits and possible negative side effects of amitriptyline? Can is it? Can one take it for long term? Yeah, yeah, it's not addictive. Okay, I mean, triptyline is an antidepressant. It works on different receptors in your brain and in the nerves. Uh, the benefits, well, it's used as an antidepressant, so it's an old antidepressant, old school one. So it improves your mood if you have depression. You know, um, uh, the it's also used for nerve pain. Okay. Um, if you produce a lot of saliva, some, there are some patients that cannot swallow their saliva, so we use it to dry their mouth because one of the side effects is to reduce the production of secretions in your body. So that means it can cause dry eyes, it can cause dry mouth, it can cause constipation, it can also cause trouble emptying bladder, depending on the dose you are taking. Okay, so not everybody tolerates it. But uh, there are people taking, you know, very good amounts and they don't have side effects. And some people take a tiny amount and yes, they have a lot of side effects. It can also cause a lot of sleepiness. So it's, it's also useful as a, a sleeping aid. So you can trouble sleeping, especially with nerve pain in your feet at night. Then you use amitriptyline, you know, make your sleep and also treat your pain. But again, it has this side effect of dry eyes, dry mouth, constipation, sleepiness, um, and maybe trouble emptying the bladder. But it's not addic addictive and it's not it's not toxic. You know, if you stop using it, then you dry mouth, your constipation will, will will disappear. Yeah, question from the audience here. Go ahead. Thank you. Is it possible to have neuropathy on part of your foot, like a few of your toes? Um, yes. So uh, yeah, no, the neuropathy can have the, the neuropathy I talk about here is the most common, which is affecting symmetrically so equally both feet and the toes but yes certain ner certain nerves in your toes or in your fingers can be affected more than others um, and that would perhaps be a different etiology some people have uh, something called morton neuroma for example which is uh, these compressions by kind of cyst under the toes that can pinch certain nerves and the toes some toes may be affected more than others that's a different type of, of neuropathy can it come from a nerve in your leg, this tingling in your toes? Yes, yes, it can, it can have, it, it can, it depends on the pattern, you know, you will need, I guess, to have an exam to see what, it, if it follows a specific nerve distribution. So there are a lot of nerves that go to your legs and each one has its own distribution. Uh, another question here from the audience. If you have neuropathy for a lack of vitamin B12 and, and you replace vitamin B12, what's the chance of the neuropathy going away? So uh, that will depend on how long the neuropathy was there. And like I mentioned, how bad the nerve was damaged beforehand, before you fix it, before you start taking the B12, okay? So if you got it right away and you do a nerve study and the nerves are still you know, alive to say it that way, 